morning. Hi, morning. Oh, we have lots of people already on. <laughs> I thought I'd get a sneak into it, but that's good. <laughs> Max, are you still planning to be the one to share your screen? Uh, yeah, I can share my screen if that works with everyone. Okay. We can keep it like this for now, and then I'll just do the introduction and then um, kind of hand it off to you to run. Okay, sounds good. That's great. Max, how's your internet been today? Uh, it's it's been good today. Hopefully, okay. she's getting any problems? Knock on wood. Okay. Who's the backup? So I think we're all gonna have a backup screen. Okay. So if, for example, someone's if Danielle is speaking and she loses internet, then any of us can just hop on, and continue what she's talking. Okay. So. Cool. That sounds great.
Hi, everyone. I just want to welcome you all. Um, we're going to wait just another couple of minutes for more people to join, and then we'll get started. Is that Colin? Hi, Colin. You're muted, but I see you talking. Thanks for joining. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> yeah, it's exciting. Oh, yes. You remember the capstone days? <laughs> of course. Yes. <laughs> How's everything going mm. with you? Working from home. Luckily enough, I'm able to work from home, and um, we are here in uh, the Keys. There is a total lockdown here, so no oh. non-residents are allowed in. Oh, wow. So it's quiet, that's, which is nice. That's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Bad, but okay, I'm glad you're doing well and still working. <laughs> yes, me too. Oh, wow. 97 people. Beautiful. This is great. Okay, I think people are still joining, so we'll do one more minute and then get started. Note that here. Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, just to confirm, Max, are all the presenters online? There's so many people I can't even tell. <laughs> yeah, let me just send a message to our group chat just to make sure that everyone's here. Okay. Um, in the meantime, I'm just going to give a brief uh, welcome and introduction. So uh, for anyone who doesn't know, I'm Marilyn Brandt. I'm a research associate professor at the University of the Virgin Islands. Um, I work in the Center for Marine and Environmental Studies, um, and I also teach in the Master of Marine and Environmental Science program. So what you're here today to see is a webinar that's going to be presented by our students in the master's program, in the MMES program, as we call it. Um, this webinar is uh, presenting the results of their uh, the 2019 cohort of MMES, their capstone project. They're also going to cover a little bit of the history of the disease here in the U.S. Virgin Islands um, and some outreach activities that they've done too. So what the capstone project is, um, it's a very important component of the MMES program here at UVI. Um, every first year student has to participate in the capstone project. So each cohort of each year work together on the project in, this, in their second semester. Um, and they receive a grade on, grade on it in all of their core courses. Um, past projects, this is supposed to be a large project uh, with territorial re relevance. So past projects have included looking at um, dynamics related to the invasion of the invasive seagrass, Halophila, Stipulaceae. Um, they've also done assessments of the impact of hurricanes Irma and Maria on coral restoration projects. Um, past cohorts have also looked at the impact of hurricanes on forest communities here in the Virgin Islands. So each year, um, the first year cohort does this project and it's supposed to have territorial relevance um, and be hypothesis driven. So this year, obviously of great relevance is the outbreak of stony coral tissue loss disease here in the US Virgin Islands that started um, a little over a year ago. They'll tell you about the history a bit. Um, it's a real dire threat to the USVI reef, so it's definitely a topic of interest. It's something that my laboratory 
in particular has been working on, so I was um, excited that the MMES cohort wanted to work on it. Um, all of the capstone projects, again, as I mentioned, are hypothesis driven, and the hypotheses are de designed really by the students. Um, all aspects of the project are led by the students. Um, they are given guidance from the core faculty in the MMES program, so that includes myself, um, as well as the director of the MMES program, Dr. Lorraine Buckley, um, and other faculty, including Dr. Renata Plattenberg, Dr. Kristen Wilson-Grimes, and Dr. Tyler Smith, who um, should probably all be on this webinar, but I can't totally see because we have so many participants, which is great. Um, this year's project also used National Coral Reef Monitoring Program data, so I'd like to acknowledge the assistance of NCREMP for um, providing the data providing training with data management, and this is in particular Jeremiah Blondeau um, helped uh, quite a bit with that. Also, Sarah Groves and Shay Veeman um, helped us to get the data that we, um, the pre-data that we used. The, um, again, the project includes students collecting the data and analyzing the data, and that and also includes them coordinating all of the field work. Um, unfortunately, some of the field work was cut short by the pandemic, but they still had collected quite a bit and have, a, I think, a compelling story to tell. Um, also, in addition to the science that you're, you'll hear today, um, you'll, they're also going to cover a little bit of um, some of their outreach. So the Capstone Project uh, also involves providing an outreach uh, product as well as a product geared towards natural resource management. So this cohort had planned to present at um, our annual Reef Fest but that obviously was canceled due to the pandemic, so they really did a fantastic job turning that around into a social media awareness campaign. And um, they've also pr produced a fact sheet for natural resource managers, so they'll tell you a bit about that at the end. Um, so again, thank you all for tuning in. We really appreciate all of this, um, this uh, support. We're now at, at 138 participants, which is fantastic. Um, at the end, we will have time for questions. It's gonna be about a 35 minute presentation. Um, the questions with this large of a group is gonna be uh, difficult to manage, but we'll do our best. So what we'll ask people to do is if you can put uh, a question or raise your hand into the chat, um, you should be able to see the chat at the bottom. Then the students will try to manage addressing all of those questions. If you get cut off in any way, um, or, or something happens to your internet, we are recording this session, so we'll try to make this recording available. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Max Cohen, who is um, going to share his screen and start the presentation. All righty, thank you, Marilyn, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. I know we have people from all over the globe, so I'll be inclusive in my mornings and afternoons. Um, I'm going to turn my video off now for connection uh, purposes, just so we don't have any uh, issues with that, and then I will also share my screen. All right, so um, as Marilyn said, uh, the UVI MMES cohort of 2019 will be talking today about the stony coral tissue loss disease in the Virgin Islands and the ecological consequences of its spread. Um, and so Kelsey Vaughn is going to start off our webinar today. And with that, I'd like to welcome Kelsey. Thank you. Kelsey, if you're talking, make sure to unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Uh, seems Kelsey's having a little bit of a technical issue. Um, one moment. Kelsey? Um, all right. 
Can you guys hear me? Yes. Now we can. Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay. So sorry. I had to call in from my phone. Don't know what's what's going on. Make sure to mute your computer, Kelsey, because you're getting a repeat. Okay. Is this better? I'm so sorry, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Good morning, everybody. Sorry for the rough start. So today you will be hearing from Danielle, Maxim, Alexis, and myself. It's important to note that we are simply just representing the entire 2019 MMES cohort who will be joining us at the end of the webinar for questions. Next, please. All right, so disease is a natural component of all ecosystems and can be a destructive force causing mortality, reduced fecundity, and reduced growth. Diseases can be host-specific in that they only target a selected set of species, such as the white pox and white band disease. Diseases can also be non-host-specific in that they target a large variety of species, such as the white plague disease. Some of the most virulent diseases which lead to high levels of mortality are tissue loss diseases. These types of outbreaks are likely to continue as diseases are most likely exasperated by rising sea surface temperatures, as well as excessive nutrients from sewage or high levels of sedimentation. Due to the fact that many diseases affect reef building coral species, outbreaks have largely contributed to changes in spatial, spatial heterogeneity and ecologic functionality in Caribbean reefs. For the Caribbean in particular, diseases have caused declines in coral cover of more than 50 to 80% within a few decades. It has been suggested that ecosystems that have a lower species diversity are more affected by diseases and even have higher disease prevalence. This is known as the dis diversity disease hypothesis. A recent study by Mueller et al. 2020 looked at stony coral tissue loss disease and looked, and looked at it if it followed this same pattern. Simply meaning, does stony coral tissue loss disease seem to affect reefs with lower species diversity? However, the study suggested that this disease does not follow this trend. Next. So stony coral tissue loss disease is a very new disease. It started in Miami-Dade County, Florida in 2014 and was believed to coincide with a massive bleaching event and the dredging of the Port of Miami from 2013 to 2015, which led to increased sedimentation loads and poor water quality. Disease susceptibility of corals has been attributed to numerous factors, such as immune responses, phylogenetic lineage age, genotype, colony size, life history rates, et cetera. So the figure at the bottom of your screen shows the typical order of infection of species. The species that appear to be most susceptible to stony coral tissue loss disease include Dendrogyrus cylindris, Pseudodiploria scragosa, meandrida meandrides. These species are followed by intermediate species, Montastria cavernosa, and various Orbicella species. So a similar study was conducted in Mexico by Alvarez Philip at all in, <clears throat> excuse me, that found similar trends, but ranked a few species differently in regards to susceptibility. So before the derivation of its distinguishing name, stony coral tissue loss disease was originally documented as a wide array of white syndrome diseases. These diseases are similar in appearance to stony coral tissue loss disease, but differ in severity of infection and impact. <clears throat> Next, please. While lesions of white plague typically start at the base of a colony, stony coral tissue loss disease can form in the center of colonies. Additionally, while many white syndrome diseases result in only partial tissue loss, stony coral tissue loss disease has been observed both in the Florida and throughout the Caribbean to frequently cause complete colony mortality. The disease arrived in the USVI where it was first seen at Flat Key on the western side of St. Thomas. The disease has now been found almost every part of St. Thomas and the disease is now heading eastward towards St. John. It is hypothesized that stony coral tissue loss disease first arrived in St. Thomas via ballast water from ships and the subsequent spread was most likely caused by local current and tidal regimes. Next slide. So this is the beginning of a progression of stony coral tissue loss disease. It represents the initial observation in January of 2019. Next. 
So the dark pink represents the area of extent and the lighter pink is going to represent the area of progression. So this just shows a progression starting uh, from January to March, next. March to July, next. To October 2019, next. To January 2020 of this year, next. And then finally, most recently, um, surveys conducted in March of 2020 show that this disease has almost completely encompassed the island of St. Thomas. It's important to note that for our study, we considered two main disease zones, an epidemic zone where sites have been affected recently and have the highest disease levels, and then an endemic zone where this disease has been for more than nine months. I'm now going to turn it over to Maxim. Uh, <clears throat> Alrighty, thank you, Kelsey. Um, so kind of jumping into the research questions and the specific objectives of our study, uh, our overall objective was to better understand the active epidemiology and ecological consequences of stony coral tissue loss disease within the U.S. Virgin Islands, in particular how it relates to the diversity disease hypothesis. Um, and our first research question was focused on the epidemic zone, which Kelsey said uh, this has had a uh, SCTLD present uh, for two to nine months. Um, and in this zone, we were interested particularly at how diversity plays a role in disease prevalence uh, and whether or not pre-outbreak species diversity made a site more or less susceptible to the disease. So our null hypothesis was that there was no relationship between species diversity and disease in the epidemic zone. And our alternatives were that there was either a positive relationship between uh, diversity and disease or that there was a negative relationship between diversity and disease. Um, our second research question here uh, it's focused on the endemic zone, which has had the disease present for more than nine months. And in these zones, we're interested in how SCTLD presence at a site can change coral diversity and cover over time. Um, and our null was that there was no relationship between uh, pre-outbreak diversity and the impact of the disease in the endemic zone. And our alternatives were that there was either a positive relationship or a negative relationship between species diversity and impact of the disease in the endemic zone. Um, so as I said, coral cover density and diversity changes were all utilized as proxies for the possible impacts of our disease and control and immersion sites were analyzed to, under, to better understand the effect of any potential confounding variables on the coral communities, such as the recent hurricanes to ravage the island. Um, and just to kind of uh, nail it down one more time, epidemic sites were areas that had uh, SCTLD present uh, between two and nine months. Endemic sites had the disease present for more than nine months. Emerging sites had the disease present for less than two months. And uh, because the disease seems to be non-host specific, it was expected that it would not follow the, the diversity disease hypothesis. And it was also hypothesized that highly diverse sites would be those that are most impacted by the disease. So uh, we have here our study uh, figure, uh, St. Thomas here in the Virgin Islands. Uh, stratified random sampling was used to sample 51 sites prior to the appearance of the disease. Um, and as Marilyn said earlier, sites sampled before the disease were done so in either 2017 or 2019 by NOAA's uh, National Coral Reef Monitoring Program. And then sites were either classified as species rich if there were more than 12 different species of coral recorded or species poor if there were less than 12 species of coral recorded. Um, and then sites were once again categorized into control, emergent, epidemic, and endemic. Um, and on our site figure here are control sites, uh, which did not have any recordings of the disease, were delineated by the squares, uh, both for species poor and for species rich. Emergen sites where Skittle had just arrived. Uh, this is the disease, the disease was present, but had not been long enough, there long enough to document an impact, was shown by the diamonds, both by species poor and species rich. At the epidemic sites where Skittle had been confirmed for, or SCTLD had been confirmed for at least two months, but not more than nine months, was represented by our circles. And endemic sites where the disease had been confirmed for longer than nine months was repre represented by our stars here. 
Um, kind of jumping into the field methods now, uh, as I said, data was collected between January and March of 2020, and sampling methodology followed guidelines set by uh, NOAA's NCREMP protocol. At each location, a coral demographic diver and a line point intercept diver conducted scuba surveys for a maximum of 30 minutes. Divers would attach a transect tape and swim 15 meters in a random direction designated before entering the water. The coral demographic diver then assessed the percent hard bottom cover within the survey area, as well as identified all species of hard coral in the service area, or in the survey area, excuse me. Uh, in addition, uh, any disease, in particular SCTLD, which is what uh, we were concerned with, was noted and the extent of the disease was also noted. Uh, benthic divers uh, conducted line point intercept surveys, which meant taking surveys at 15 centimeter intervals along the transect and identifying and categorizing the substratum type. Uh, for example, you have bare substrate, macro algae, uh, ramacrusta, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, overall disease prevalence was then determined by dividing the number of affected corals by the total uh, of, by the total number of corals. And the species specific disease prevalence was obtained by dividing the total number of corals by, the speci by species by the number of affected corals. Uh, and as we mentioned earlier, we assess site diversity in a number of ways, including species richness, the Shannon Wiener index, as well as the Simpson index. Uh, and coral, de coral density was measured by the divi dividing the total number of corals by the meters squared. Um, and disease prevalence was determined by dividing the number of affected corals by the total number of corals. Uh, and we see here, these were on the top right here, these are the data sheets that we were using, uh, the same data sheets that no, uh, NCREMP uses for their uh, studies. And these are, this is a photo of a diver conducting our coral demographic survey. So um, data was for the epidemic zone. Uh, was collected and then analyzed using linear regression. Uh, our response variable was disease prevalence and the independent variables were as followed. Uh, we have species richness, Shannon index, Simpson index, coral density, and coral cover. And these results assisted in answering our first research question being, are sites with higher diversity showing higher levels of disease? Uh, and then data for our endemic zone, which was affected for more than nine months, uh, was also uh, analyzed using a linear regression with the response variables as follows and the independent variables uh, as follows. Um, and these results helped us in determining whether sites with previously higher diversity were more affected by the disease than sites with previously lower diversity. Um, and then the same analyses that were applied to the uh, endemic zone were also applied to the control and emergent sites. Um, and with that, I would like to turn it over to Danielle. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Max. Um, good morning, everyone. So before fully addressing our research questions, control and emergent sites, as mentioned, were examined for any baseline changes that may have occurred between 2017 or 2019 and present. This graph represents the relationship between coral density on the x-axis and the calculated change in coral density from past data to present displayed on the y-axis. The displayed line of the graph was computed by performing linear regression, and it was found that this relationship was significant, which suggests that the greater the coral density before the SCTLD outbreak, the greater was the change in density at those sites. Next. Likewise, this graph represents the relationship between species richness displayed on the x-axis and the calculated change in species richness from past data to present displayed on the y-axis. The performed linear regression was again significant, which suggests that the greater species richness before the SCTLD outbreak, the greater was the change in richness at that site. And so both of these parameters combined show us that these sites lost density and species, and they were telling us that they may have been significantly impacted by hurricanes Irma and Maria in 2017, so there already, already was some baseline disturbance at sites. Next. Now this makes sense because all of our control sites were situated on the northeastern part of the island, shown in the red box on the figure. However, this happened to be the only part that did not get the disease as yet. 
but was also hit the hardest by these hurricanes as the eye of Hurricane Irma passed directly over these sites and so most likely experienced the greatest hurricane related damage compared to the entire island. They probably encompassed the greatest physical damage when compared to all other sites. And additionally, data from the Territorial Coral Reef Monitoring Program does not show declines related to these hurricanes in the endemic zone. Next. Now to circle back to our research questions, our first question as a reminder was, is there a relationship between disease prevalence and coral diversity in the epidemic zone? And as a recap, we assessed numerous variables. However, in the interest of time, we will be highlighting our findings related to species specific disease susceptibility, which we defined using disease prevalence and the relationship between disease prevalence and coral diversity, specifically the Shannon Wiener Index or a measure of diversity that comes up with a specific number to describe the species richness or the number of different species at a site and their relative abundance. Next. So overall disease prevalence was found to be greater in the epidemic than in the endemic zone, which made sense because the epidemic zone represents where SCTLD had first taken its true hold on coral species within these sites and thus is believed to be at peak infection. In regards to species specific SCTLD susceptibility within the epidemic zone, high susceptibility was defined as having disease prevalence greater than 40%. And so eight species were found to fit this criteria. And this included the pillar coral, which is an endangered coral species, three distinct species of brain coral, as well as the maize, elliptical star, low-life lettuce, and the large cup star coral. The number of corals for each species that were surveyed within the epidemic zone only are depicted by N, and this will remain the same for the next slides as well. The listing of these species all matched that of the SCTLD case description published in 2018 for Florida and the alvarez Fleet study in Mexico in 2019, with the exception of Agaricia humilis, which was previously severely data deficient. So it was definitely intriguing to find that here in the US Virgin Islands, this species may be highly susceptible. Next. Intermediate susceptibility was defined as having disease prevalence from 25 to 40%, and only four species were found to be intermediately susceptible, including the lettuce coral, the smooth flower coral, and two species of star coral. The Orbicella species again matched listings from the SCTLD case description published in 2018 for Florida and the Alvarez Philippe study in Mexico in 2019 and are both endangered corals, but the other two species were quite interesting. Agaricia agricides was again data deficient in this regard, but additionally, Eusimilia fastigiata was listed as highly susceptible in both previous studies and for us was only intermediate. So there may be some differences in how SCTLD is affecting the species here in the Virgin Islands. Next. Low susceptibility was defined as having disease prevalence less than 25%, encompassing eight species, including the star, mustard hill, finger, blushing star, cactus, starlet, saucer, and sheet coral. These findings, especially for parietal species, were not unexpected as these matched up with the listings from the past two studies as well. However, Orbicella annularis, another endangered species, and S. intercepta were previously listed as intermediate in those other regions, but for us was only low. Again, highlighting potential differences in Virgin Islands coral susceptibility. Additionally, the other species shown here were previously data deficient. Next. Lastly, all coral species that were not encountered within the epidemic zone only, specifically were listed as having an unknown susceptibility, being that they were not encountered and are listed here, with the Acropora species being currently endangered. Next. Now, in terms of examining the relationship between SCTLD and diversity, this graph depicts the relationship between the Shannon Wiener Diversity Index four epidemic sites on the x-axis and disease prevalence on the y-axis. No significant relationship was found between these variables following a linear regression. However, trends do suggest 
that SCTLD was more prevalent at more diverse sites. Next. These increasing disease trends further suggest that SCTLD may indeed not follow the diversity disease hypothesis, which is what we initially thought, and may be initially infecting sites equally within the epidemic zone. Next. Moving on to our second question, which was, is there a relationship between the impacts of SCTLD and diversity in the endemic zone? Again, we assessed numerous variables as previously mentioned. However, for the endemic zone, we focused on highlighting how pre-outbreak Shannon Wiener diversity was related to both the change in coral cover and change in diversity. Next. This graph depicts the relationship between the pre-outbreak Shannon Wiener diversity on the x-axis and the proportional change in Shannon Wiener diversity on the y-axis. A significant relationship was found between the two when a linear regression was performed. And this was interesting because this suggests that more diverse sites lost more diversity, meaning that SCTLD may again not be following the diversity disease hypothesis. Next. Additionally, this graph shows a relationship between the pre-outbreak Shannon Wiener diversity on the x-axis and the proportional change in coral cover on the y-axis. Again, a significant relationship was found between these variables, but this was especially intriguing because it suggests that more diverse sites were losing less coral cover than less diverse sites. So tying this back into the previous graph, this means that these diverse sites lost diversity, but not coral cover, which was a pretty unexpected but exciting find. Next. So what we think is going on here is that again, SCTLD is not following the diversity disease hypothesis within the endemic zone, but also it is rarer species that do not contribute, contribute greatly to coral cover that are being lost, thus having big impacts for site diversity. Next. To give a better idea of what this looks like, we believe that some of these highly susceptible species and possibly maybe even some of the intermediately susceptible ones that are smaller and rarer are what are being lost from coral reefs due to SCTLD. This means that the diversity of these sites following SCTLD infection is changing dramatically and the ecosystem effects of these community changes are unknown. Next. So just to sum up our general conclusions, we did find some differences in species specific susceptibility and were able to gather information on species that were previously data deficient. We also found that SCTLD does not follow the diversity disease hypothesis in both the epidemic zone where trends suggest that disease prevalence was greater in more diverse sites and the endemic zone where impact was greater for more diverse sites. Lastly, we found that rarer species that do not contribute greatly to coral cover are what are being lost from US Virgin Islands coral reefs, which largely impacts reef diversity. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Alexis, who's gonna talk more about the management implications of these findings. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, so as we just learned in the results section, highly diverse reefs in the Virgin Islands and the rare species that are in them may be at the most risk to stony coral tissue loss disease. So we can direct a lot of our efforts towards monitoring known highly diverse sites in the path of the disease front, because the earlier we detect the disease at a site, the sooner we can act to reduce the impacts that this disease has on the reef. We can also work to remove colonies of highly susceptible and rare species or fragments of colonies of these species so that they remain healthy and can later be used in restoration efforts. Um, in addition to removing healthy corals, we can continue to work to find effective antibiotic treatments and regularly apply these treatments to disease colonies. Also, enforcing ballast water regulations can help to prevent large vessels from introducing contaminated water to healthy reefs and accelerating the spread of this disease throughout the territory. Finally, it's really important that we spread awareness about stony coral tissue loss disease and the impacts that it's had on the reefs in the USVI. Uh, people outside of the scientific or research community, people who have interest in the economic, recreational, 
as well as intrinsic value of these reefs, also want to know more about what this disease is doing to the reefs. Next. I can say that with some certainty because our cohort also ran a social media campaign that we labeled hashtag Stony Coral Tissue Loss Disease Awareness Week on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. This outreach plan was headed up by my classmate, Madison Miller, and she did a great job of organizing members of our cohort into teams so that we could effectively run these accounts on different platforms. Our campaign posts reached and were seen by over 15,000 people from many different groups and backgrounds, including young adults, coral biologists from around the world, and members of the St. Thomas and Virgin Islands community. The campaign was really exciting to be a part of because it got our message about this disease out to people who may not have had access to this information or been able to ask questions about it otherwise. It was really effective to get the attention of people quickly. Um, our Instagram account, which you can see here, gained 200 followers in a matter of a couple of weeks, and people were actively participating and asking us questions, not just looking at the posts. Um, you can see in the picture on the right, some questions that our followers asked about treatment effectiveness and how resilient different species of coral were to the disease. And we did our best to answer their questions and interact back with them as well. Next. Facebook was another popular forum for people to learn about stony coral tissue loss disease. 314 people currently like the UVI MMES page. And our post had over 14,000 engagements. And engagements are just defined as people liking the pages in our posts, sharing them, commenting on them, pretty much any kind of interaction with our posts or our page. We can also confirm that our posts reach over 18,000 unique viewers. And we shared our posts in the Facebook group, What's Going On St. Thomas, which is really popular for those who live not just on St. Thomas, but in the Virgin Islands as well, to increase our outreach spread that way. Next. Twitter was also really popular. Uh, we had over 18,000 people see our tweets and over 1,000 engagements here too which is defined the same way, just as likes, retweets, follows, or opening up the tweet or our page. Uh, here you can see one of our initial posts that we used to kick off the beginning of our campaign. And it was retweeted 12 times and like 17 times. And this is before we really gave many, much information about stony coral tissue loss disease. It was also pretty interesting that our audience and people who were communicating with us were primarily marine scientists on Twitter. Next. So the image on the left shows one of our initial tweets uh, from April 3rd. It was posted so that our followers would stay tuned for more information about Stony Coral Tissue Loss Awareness Week. In the large text above the picture, you can see that one of our followers tagged another account, showing that people who are interested in what we have to say were also spreading the word about our research to their friends and colleagues, which is great news for us. And the image on the right shows our tweet regarding this webinar and the 15 retweets and 19 comments that I got. So some of you all who are, in, who are in attendance may have found out about our webinar through our social media platforms. And we'd like to thank you, not only for showing up for our talk now, but also for actively participating and keeping up with our posts. Next. In addition to raising awareness about this disease, there are steps that we can take actively when we go out in the field doing work now to prevent the spread of this disease to unimpacted reefs. So you can infect, disinfect, excuse me, all of your gear, your diving and snorkeling gear with the 1% bleach solution or about one cup for a five gallon bucket. Uh, you can also make just environmentally conscious choices so that we reduce stress on corals, like avoiding them when anchoring and not touching them, as well as reporting potential sightings at vicoraldisease.org. Next. For more information, about stony coral tissue loss disease, about how it's spreading, the research being conducted on it, and more things that we can do to help, please visit vicoraldisease.org. Um, as I said in the slide before, there's a place to report sightings if you're out in the water and you suspect that you see a coral that's affected. Um, you can enter geographical information, pictures, descriptions of the reef type and its health, general observations. Uh, it's a really cool forum for that. You can also follow and keep tabs on our Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook accounts at UVI MMES. Uh, our cohort also produced a fact sheet. My colleague Kayla Budd headed that up and she worked really hard to make a super informative fact sheet that we'd love for you all to see. So just stay tuned for more information about that. Next. And with that, 
the UVI MMES 2019 cohort would like to thank all of the parties that allowed our capstone to be made possible. For funding our fieldwork costs, we want to thank the NSF for a rapid grant awarded to Dr. Marilyn Brandt, the UVI TCRIMP program, and the UVI MMES program. We want to thank the MMES program not just for financial support, but from just top to bottom support on this project. We received a lot of help from a lot of different people on a lot of different aspects of our project. So we want to thank everyone who volunteered to help us, including fellow grad students, lab technicians, recent graduates, dive instructors, and boat managers. We want to thank all of you. We also want to thank Jeremiah Blondeau for training our cohort in increment methodology and allowing us access to the database, as well as Sarah Groves and Shay Veeman for providing us with the increment data from 2017 and 2019. We want to thank you at the VI Coral Disease Advisory Committee for giving us this platform to speak to you all about our research. And we want to thank everybody who gave us a lot of feedback on our fact sheet. And we also want to expand a special thanks to our core faculty for their tremendous contributions to our project. Doctors Marilyn Brandt, Tyler Smith, Renata Plattenberg, Kristen Wilson-Grimes, and Lorraine Buckley were more than essential to this project and we're extremely grateful for all of their hard work. Next. Here are our references. Next again. And with that, we'd like to thank you all for attending this webinar and open the floor to questions. That's great. Thank you guys. I'm clapping, representing the over 160 participants on the meeting. <laughs> um, so everyone, this is Marilyn Brandt again. Um, just saying, just want to let you know that uh, we would love for you to post some questions. Um, I think the best way to do that is for you to put them in the chat and the uh, MMES students are help to um, manage those. If you don't get your question answered, uh, please feel free to contact us through contacts on the vicoraldisease.org website. There has already been one question that I see. This is Dr. Kristen Wilson Grime and I'll Grimes, and I'll just answer this one. There is a question about where the recording for this webinar will be posted, and that will be on the website vicoraldisease.org. Okay, I see a question. Um, what are some reasons that coral diversity may affect the reef susceptibility to skittled? Sorry, to SETLD. <clears throat> Um, do you guys want to take that? Hi, yeah, sure. I can take that. Um, my name's Kaya. I'm one of the cohort members. Um, so the question again is some reasons that coral diversity may affect a reef susceptibility to skittled. So um, one of the reasons we think that is happening or, or that we hypothesize that's going to happen, normally a lot of coral diseases um, affect many, or so, sorry, affect very few um, coral species. So one example I can give is um, a paper, AB et al. 2011. They, um, the authors there were testing um, disease of a cropper white syndrome, where that disease, just like many other diseases, affect just like three or four um, species. But skittled is, or sorry, stony coral tissue loss disease is very different in that it affects about like 22 species of stony corals. Um, so we're thinking, or um, it, we think that for that reason, it might not follow the diversity disease hypothesis because there's just more, um, more out there. So more species in the reef that it could um, attack if it is a highly diverse reef. So for example, if we have a reef that's only um, mainly acroperids and it's just few species of acroperids, that's a very low, uh, low susceptibility species. So maybe that reef is lower in diversity and better um, and less susceptible as a community to getting stony coral tissue loss disease. Does that answer your question? Thanks. Kaya, this is Marilyn again. I just want to, um, there is one long question that I think you guys should answer, but there is a question about um, 
someone being interested in the microbiology of the disease, and is there any research about that topic? And I think I can answer that question. So we do have a rapid grant from the National Science Foundation, and we have um, collaborate, we're collaborating with several labs to understand the microbiology of the disease here. So we have samples that are currently being processed um, and analyzed by Amy April's lab at Woods Hole as well as Adrian Correa's lab at Rice University. And we're working with Aaron Muller at Moat, uh, Moat Marine Lab to understand how that compares to the Florida samples. Um, and actually one of our grad students, Naomi Huntley, just defended her um, thesis on the microbial communities associated with mucus and in diseased corals of multiple species. Um, so she defended her thesis, so we're working on publications related to that, and we hope to have future webinars that cover some of that research. So um, that is in process. There was another uh, question from Hillary Lohman that uh, says if Skittle, sorry, if stony coral tissue loss disease, I keep making that same mistake, um, if stony coral tissue loss disease extends three quarters around St. Thomas and is mostly deadly, does this mean that St. Thomas has lost three quarters of its stony corals since 2019? Um, can you respond to this generalization? And what do your coral cover diversity findings offer in response to this? Great job, thanks, also. Um, do you guys wanna take that question? Uh, <clears throat> Hi guys, this is Annie Savage. I'm also a student, <clears throat> excuse me, in the 2019 cohort. I can um, answer some of that. And if Marilyn, you have anything to add to maybe offer more clarification, that'd be great. Um, from what I know, a site can be impacted by stony coral tissue loss disease, but some live coral tissue can still remain in the site even after impact and even on impacted corals. So even potentially if a site is impacted by stony coral tissue loss disease, it doesn't necessarily mean it's lost all of the live coral tissue within a site. I would definitely agree with that, Annie. I think you did a good job. Um, Yes, just to emphasize, as some of the results pointed out, not all corals are affected by this disease and they are all differently affected by it. So uh, one of the first sites that became affected though, Flat Key, the Territorial Coral Reef Monitoring Program here led by Dr. Tyler Smith, um, has shown that that site in particular, that's been the longest affected, has lost greater than 60% of its coral cover, um, so its total coral. So it still has coral left, um, but no, that doesn't mean that St. Thomas has lost three quarters of its corals, but it has lost quite a, quite a bit. Um, another question, let's see, oh, Karen Neely. Um, she said, you note that higher diversity resulted in higher disease prevalence, but I suspect your low diversity sites are full primarily of the weedy species that are of lower susceptibility anyway like Parides astroides and Sideroastria. Is there a way to tease out the susceptibility factor from the diversity factor? For example, if your low diversity sites were just full of Dendrogyra and Dicocenia, I suspect your low diversity sites would show incredibly high prevalence. Who wants to take that question? It's a great question. Um, I can take that question. I'm Alexis Long. Uh, I suspect that if our low diversity sites had only highly susceptible species, it would probably show high prevalence too. But I mean, that's just not what we saw like out in the field. Like most of our sites were dominated by the weedy species, as you said. And there were some sites that had a lot of orbicellids and um, other species. Well, yeah, the orbicellid species there. But I'm kind of thinking about like just because I participated in data analysis a lot too. If we took out a lot of the weedy species like the Porites and the Sideroastrias, we probably wouldn't even have enough samples to run any analyses on that because there weren't a lot of Dendrogyra or Dicoinia, like there just weren't a lot there. So you're probably right that, you know, if they were there, they were diseased, but I just, I don't think we can speak to that right now. Uh, hi guys, this is Sophie Costa. I just wanted to add on a little bit to that. Um, 
yeah, like Alexis said, for some of those species that are highly susceptible, our sample size just wasn't quite as large. But I do think that as far as future implications, that's where we're hoping our research will go or follow up research will go is to look um, at some of these sites, especially throughout the Caribbean that might have uh, locations with highly susceptible species um, to see what sort of improvements or preliminary um, research or uh, protection can be made for those sites. I'd also like to add that um, these guys have not stopped with their data analysis. <laughs> they are plowing through and doing more deeper analysis into species composition. Like Sophie said, they're still they're still working on it. So I think some of that stuff will be teased out. Definitely. Um, some more questions. Uh, two questions. What are the trademarks you use to identify SCTLD affected corals? And what is the most likely reason so far as to why a crop roads are not affected by SCTLD? Hi, this is Kayla Budd with the 2019 cohort. Um, I, can, I can take this one. So when we're out in the field, what we're looking for to determine if a, if a coral has SCTLD is gonna be multiple lesions or multiple spots. That's one of the key indicators. Um, whereas the white diseases typically have a lesion around the base or only one lesion, stony coral tissue loss disease can have multiple. And also it can happen on the center of the colony, not just at the base. We also look at the rate of tissue loss. So stony coral tissue loss disease moves very rapidly and algae do not have time to colonize the coral very quickly. So you see a wide band or a very large, very bright white lesion instead of seeing old mortality represented by um, algal cover. So that's, those are kind of the main things that we look for when we're identifying the disease. As for your second question as to why acroporas aren't affected, we're not really sure, but that seems to be a trend um, in other areas as well, as we've seen from previous studies. Um, some future research could look into whether or not species lineage age plays a factor. This is something that we would like to look into, but the scope of this project just didn't allow for us to do that as well. Great, thanks Kayla. Um, the next question is, did we apply antibiotic? Did you apply antibiotic into the corals? If so, what were, what were your observations? Was it effective or not? So the scope of this project, I can answer that. The scope of this project um, for the capstone uh, for these students was really just related to understanding the distribution of the disease in relationship to the coral community. Uh, we do have another pro program occurring that you can see on our on the website vicoraldisease.org, where we yes we are testing treatments of corals, including the the application of antibiotics, and we are tracking um, the fates of those corals. Uh, we don't have I'm helping to lead some of those efforts in the Virgin Islands. We don't have a ton of great data yet to say how effective that is. Um, but NOAA will be hosting a webinar, and I need to look at that information. Um, they will be hosting a webinar about treatment and intervention approaches for um, SCTLD. And in that, I will be presenting some of that information, and that's going to occur May 19th. Um, and you can check on uh, the, the Florida coral disease site. We'll also probably post it on vicoraldisease.org for more information about that webinar. Um, next question, Sonora asked, do you, why do you think Eusmelia fastigiata is less susceptible in this study than in the case description? Anybody want to take that? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, so we're still flushing out our susceptibility. These are just based on our preliminary data analysis. Um, so as Marilyn said, we're still trying um, to flush out some of these species. However, based on the sample size that we have, it did fall under um, the, the uh, 
intermediate susceptibility range. However, that is something that we're still looking into. Great, thanks, Sophie. Um, Joe asked, um, as we move into the second year of disease impacts, do you expect some of these trends to be maintained in the long term, especially as the disease extirpates the highly susceptible species and lowers uh, disease and lowers disease prevalence? Um, will we be able to potentially reintroduce these species? Anybody want to take that? Um, yeah, I can. So we are not exactly sure maybe when we can reintroduce some of these species. I don't think we know as yet when the disease is fully flushed out of these systems, sorry. Um, and especially for some of the intermediately susceptible species, the disease kind of lingers. So it's possible that it may still be there. And if we introduce, especially some of the highly susceptible ones, they can contract the disease. So it's something that has to be looked into more. Thanks, Danielle. Um, next question, have you found variability in disease prevalence throughout the year? If so, are there any known correlates? Um, that's from Brian Walker. Thanks for joining, Brian. Um, I'm actually going to take this one because I think it's beyond the capstone project. Um, we've been tracking it now for a year and um, we had a project that was a grad student project, Sonora Myling's uh, thesis project. She just defended it and she's working on continuing to work on some of that data. And we did find that disease seemed to um, decline in the fall when uh, at the same time we had a, a huge increase in thermal stress that resulted in a pretty significant bleaching event. So we found that um, we're still looking at that data though. So we don't, uh, we can't say for sure that that happened, but um, anecdotally it did seem for right now that disease prevalence declined when temperatures increased and thermal stress accumulated. Um, next question, could the difference in susceptibility compared to previous studies be related to differences in species composition? You guys should take that one. Uh, yeah, hi, Annie again. Um, yes. Uh, especially when you compare our results to Florida, we have certain species represented here in the United States Virgin Islands that just aren't in the Florida reef track, which definitely does correspond to why we found results for certain species um, in Florida hadn't previously found those results. It's also similar in case with the Alvarez et al. study, which looked at the um, it looked at coral in Mexico with the kind of same similar phenomena. We just have species represented here that they didn't have represented in their studies. Um, I'd like to add on to that. Uh, Annie summed that up pretty well in terms of species composition, but uh, the same species of coral that are here that are in other places may be exposed to different environmental conditions that affect their ability to fight against the disease or um, succumb to it. So maybe there's a difference in the baseline coral health in different places before the coral contracts the disease that also affects its susceptibility. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and, oh right, Sonora chimed in here and just wanted to add that half of the colonies that she was monitoring through the bleaching event, half of them, um, their lesions stopped progressing during the bleaching event. I think some of them picked back up after the bleaching event, but she can chime in about that too. Um, so Colin asked, uh, an MMES alum, guys, Colin, um, asked, touching on your suggested management of SCTLD, which coral species would be a high priority for restoration and propagation? Are certain species more feasible than others? Who wants to take that? Um, hey, Colin. Um, yeah, so I definitely think that there are some species that are uh, of greater priority. Um, for example, uh, one of our highly susceptible species was the pillar coral, which is an ESA listed species. Um, so I think that obviously, first off, ESA listed species should be of greatest concern. 
uh, in particular species like the pillar coral, which are not only listed, but also highly susceptible. So I think we should go first looking at the species that uh, are rare and not as prevalent, and then also looking at the susceptibility. So I think looking at susceptibility and uh, kind of abundance and possible uh, rare species, I think those should be of the biggest concern. And then uh, going off your second question, I think that uh, species that are easy, easily, um, easily regrown, um, so these are going to be your branching corals, I think those may be, I'm not sure, maybe Marilyn can touch upon this as well, uh, it seems to be that those corals are easier to regrow and uh, replant, so I'm not sure if maybe those would be uh, corals that we would focus on as well. I can add to that uh, a little bit, this is Kayla again. Um, we do have uh, another master student from another cohort who is working on fragmentation of some coral species. Uh, so there could be some possibility of, I'm sorry, microfragmentation and outplanting. And so there could be some potential for some of these species to do a um, similar program that would be uh, quicker than outplanting some of the other species. That's great. Thank you guys. Well, I think we need to um, wrap this up. I just want to thank the 2019 cohort again for a fantastic job presenting their capstone research. Um, keep an eye out for more updates from them. Madison posted to um, make sure to follow them on social media with more up-to-date information. Also check out the new website, vicoraldisease.org that we keep plugging. Um, I just want to mention that that website was designed and put together by the Virgin Islands Coral Disease Advisory Committee, um, and in particular, Elisa Lakatena helped to design that website and launch it, and the communications team um, from the VI CDAC, which is listed on the website, helped to launch that. So thank you all again for joining. Um, I will... Uh, uh, arranged to have this, the recording of this webinar posted. Um, does the cohort need, want to say anything else or should we wrap it up? No? Nope. Okay. All right. Great. Well, thank you all again. Um, it looks like you're getting a lot of congratulations over on the side and um, we will uh, be in touch soon with more information. Thank you. Hey guys, when everyone leaves, I have a question about one of your slides. Okay, guys, I have to drop off. I wanted to see if there's any anything else in the chat, but that means I'm going to start another Zoom meeting that is at 11, so that's going to cut this off. So just letting you all know, Sonora, I don't know if you can send that question by email. Yeah, Sonora, if you want to email me your, your question, we can, I can take a look at it. Yeah, we can do that. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, guys. I'm trying to save the chat, too. Okay. All right. I'm ending it. Great job. Hey, thank Bye. you. Thanks, Bye. Thanks.